I have the privilege of introducing our speaker, who probably doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Our speaker, Roy Ice, is on the staff of the Loma Linda University Church. He, in, in 25 years of ministry, he has been an author, a chaplain, and a college teacher. He will also be speaking this evening, so this isn't the end. Come back this evening after the afternoon conference. But I have three things to tell you about him that are not included in any of the information that you've received. He and I talked about this. Two of these little factoids, let's call them, are true and one is false. And it's your job to figure out which one is false. And Pastor Roy will be your judge. Since he's talking on the character of God, I mean, he might as well be the judge, right? Okay, so he'll be our judge. But first, three factoids. You get to decide some pieces of trivia from his life. First, he had four years of accordion lessons. Two, in his teaching profession, he had the privilege of teaching two Olympic gold medalists. He has two boys and one girl. Okay, Pastor Rice, you want to help us out on this? As the ultimate judge of the truth of these facts, do, do we want to take them one at a time, or how would you I, like to I, do this? I think we should have the people vote on it. Okay, let, yes. let's vote on number one. He had four years of accordion lessons. True or false? True, if it's true, raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> oh, saying, little... Please be true. Please be true. <laughs> okay. That looked like about 30% of the uh, yeah, audience. Yeah. They, they, thank you. I don't look like an accordion player. I don't know what that says, but thank you to 70% of you. <laughs> two. He taught two Olympic gold medalists. How many of you think that's true? Wow. I can sell you guys anything, can I? <laughs> okay. Good. And the third, he has about uh, has two boys and one girl. It's about the same number wow. of people each time. Wow, and I think it was the same people voting <laughs> each time, too. <laughs> we didn't tell them they only had two votes, did we? <laughs> wow. Okay, so we want to go through. The, the first one, he had right. four years of accordion lessons, is unfortunately true. <laughs> yes. I can, I can play any hymn. But unfortunately, it sounds like a mean polka. <laughs> Every hymn. All right. And, 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 yeah, so I can, I can play the squeeze box. Thanks, Mom. Uh, That's good. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard the accordion? It's yes. not good. Uh, and the That's second why I chose one, the trumpet. <laughs> yes, the second one, uh, I taught two Olympic gold medalists is true. Yes, uh, and well, thank you. I, I, <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose. It just happened. Uh, and I didn't teach them their sport. That's oh. for sure. Because the first one was in 1992. Uh, I taught English because uh, I was start, starting up an English language school in Odessa, Ukraine. And I taught uh, level one English to gold medal ice skater Oksana Bayul. Wow. The second uh, multi-gold and, and silver medalist, uh, the most decorated uh, woman in her sport in the history of the sport of rowing, I fortunately was able to teach uh, senior Bible class to Mary Whipple. Wow. And those of you who watched the Olympics, uh, the Summer Olympics, most recent one, uh, you would see her commentating. She's now a commentator for the sport. And so wow. those are those. So which brings us to the third one, because we've had two true. The uh, third statement was, I have two boys and one girl. My wife wishes, but we have two boys. <laughs> yes. I got my wife a little girl. She's got four legs and a lot of black fur. And I said, we can try for a girl or we can have three boys. Um, and she said, the dog's fine. <laughs> yes. Yes. Let me pray for you and then we'll Thank give you, you your time. Gracious Father, it is a joy to be in your presence. And we thank you that you've sent your servant. Pastor Roy, to be with us today. Use him now to help us know you better, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, John. I bring you greetings from Loma Linda University Church. Uh, and anytime you're going to be in our area, please let me know. We'd love, to, uh, we'd love to be host to you and make sure that you have the most blessed Sabbath there whenever you're there. I'm thankful to have this chance to be here. I'm usually here in February. And once I've been here in March, and it's always 
been an ice storm when I've been here. And so I'm very thankful that I'm here during the summer to experience the beautiful uh, landscape of Kansas, Nebraska. Uh, and I can actually see it, not covered in a blanket of white. And so I'm thankful uh, to be here today. Have you ever misunderstood some lyrics to a song? That can lead to uh, quite some unfortunate circumstances. Sometimes it's okay. Uh, I think of the story of the little girl who was setting up the Christmas nativity scene up on the hearth above the fireplace, and she's setting it up, and, and the parents noticed that she had created out of construction paper this little elf-like man, drew him perfectly, decorated him, and placed him right there in the middle of the nativity scene. Her parents, curious and also concerned about her theology, asked, so who's that man in the middle of the nativity scene? To which the little girl said, well, that's John. Like, hello, duh, it's John. Her parents say, um, who's John? To which the little girl replied, you know, like the song, around John's furniture, mother and child. <laughs> Added a whole new person to the scene. I love the story of the little girl who, she went to her grandmother's house every day after school, and her grandma had a habit. Every day after school, she'd be there in the kitchen while her granddaughter's there at the counter doing her homework. She'd be there fixing her favorite beverage right at the sink and, and singing her favorite hymn. It wasn't until years later that the girl was singing the hymn in church and realized that the hymn doesn't go, love, Lipton tea, love, Lipton tea. <laughs> this whole time she thought, you know, what a wonderful beverage and it's spiritual too. Had a lady come up to me uh, one time I spoke at a camp meeting. She came up and she said her daughter would go around the house singing, a zombie, a zombie, Jesus wants me for a zombie. <laughs> I'll tell you what I told her. I said, well, we kind of sing like that, don't we? Bunch of zombies. Silly things can happen when you misunderstand lyrics, but today we're going to look at a song that if you misunderstand these lyrics, it can be fatal, absolutely fatal to you spiritually. And it all hinges on this one question, does God forsake people? Does God forsake people? If I were to ask you to show you, how many of you think God forsakes people? Uh, most of you would say, uh, your gut reaction would be, no, no, God does not forsake people. No, it's not in his nature. But then some of you would lower your hand and say, but wait a minute, wasn't there, wasn't there a time? A time when Jesus himself said something along the lines of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in your heart you think, if God the Father would forsake his own son, of course, he would forsake me, lowly sinner that I am. But I want to tell you today the reason why you would ever entertain in your mind at any time that God the Father would ever forsake you has everything to do with misunderstood lyrics. Jesus at a very tough time in his experience. During the time when he's ministering on the earth, he sang a song. Did you know Jesus could sing? Oh, you bet Jesus could sing. If he could tap dance on the water, if he could make the rocks cry out, if he could collect thousands of groupies and make the dead roll over in their graves, you bet he could sing. Jesus sang, we have it recorded in the scripture, he sang a song and it was not a happy song. It was kind of, kind of a sad song. It was a song from their hymn book of the day, a song that everyone recognized the moment Jesus started singing it. But it was not a happy song. It was hymn number 22. It was written by David. It was not one of David's happier songs. It was during Dave's blues period, which is like saying every other day for the, the manic depressant songwriter. Have you ever read through the Psalms? 
just read through the Psalms. It's, it's the most manic, depressing experience you could ever have because you read one song and it's like, way to go, God. And you read the next song, it's like, where'd you go, God? We, uh, we, uh, we, uh. We love hymn number 23. In fact, that was one of the people's favorite songs. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We love that hymn, but that's not the hymn that Jesus chose to sing. He chose to sing the hymn just before that, hymn number 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hymn number 22. Where did he sing it? Like I said, it's a tough time during Jesus' experience because it's at a moment when he's trying to catch his breath. Not because he's been exercising, not because he just sang the battle hymn of the Republic. He's out of breath because that's what happens when you're hanging on a cross. What kills you when you're hanging on a cross is not the nails. Those are extremely painful, but what kills you is suffocation. That's how you die on a cross. Because as you're hanging there, you have to pull yourself up on the most painful points of your body in order to get a lung full of air enough to make any sound, much less breathe. So imagine Jesus Christ on the cross, pulling himself up, his throat dry, struggling for enough breath to begin singing hymn number 22. He pulls himself up and through parched lips and a cracking throat, he sings, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All of us have read through that and we've concluded in our heart, in that moment, Jesus Christ felt abandoned by his own father. And he's crying out to his father, where are you? This is my time of greatest need. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But can I retune the song of the cross? Can I take that, that scene of the cross and can I help you see it the way that the people around the cross would have seen it? Because when they heard him cry out, something else happened in their, in their hearts. And it wasn't a thought of he's crying out to God because he feels all alone. That's not what the people around the cross heard. Because for the same reason, if I were to say the words, would you be free from your burden of sin, immediately in your mind you would say, there's power in the blood. Why did that just happen? Because famous hymns, the lyrics come to our mind. The moment you start the song, your mind continues the song. And some of you are still singing power in the blood in your, in your head. That's what's happening around the cross because Christ pulls himself up and with a breath he says, my God, my God, why would... Why, why have you forsaken me? And the people begin singing this song. They've sung it. They haven't sung it as much as Psalm 23. They sang it about as, as common as we sing, day is dying in the West. Because it's not a happy song. It's a depressing song. It's a dark song. But the people begin to sing this song in their mind. And if you will, open up your hymnals to Psalm number 22 because you need to see what are the words that were flashing into the people's minds that are standing around the cross at that moment. And I want you to join me in Psalm 22. I'm going to begin with verse 7 which says, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Verse 8, he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And at that moment, if you were at the scene of the cross, you'd look over and you would see someone hurling insults saying, if you are who you say you are, come down from the cross. Verse 9, yet... You brought me out of the womb. And you look over, and the people are saying, this couldn't be the Messiah. It's from Mary. Mary's right there at the foot of the cross. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. Let's jump down to verse 14, where your, your song continues, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart 
has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. If you read Matthew 27's version of this story, right after Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Someone says, he needs, he needs vinegar, and they, he's thirsty, and they run and get him a sponge and lift it on a pole. And as someone's lifting that up, you, you sing the words in your head, my, stu- my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. And as that song is going through your head, you look over and you see the men casting lots for the clothing. I have an easy question for you. At what time in David's life did he ever experience having his hands and feet pierced? At what time in his life were his bones all out of joint? At what time in his life were his clothes ever cast lots for? When did David experience any of the things that he just listed in the song? You're right. On the 3rd of November, it never happened. It didn't happen to him. Which tells me something else. I've always thought of David as a shepherd and a songwriter and a as a fugitive, as a king, as a giant slayer, but I never ever thought of him as a prophet. This is prophecy. God breathed words into David, which tells me something else. God decided to inspire the lyrics to his song into the people's hymnal inspired David to write them down, to put them to music so that it would be common, common knowledge in the minds of the people, so that that day when Christ himself would sing the very words that he wrote, that all the people would realize the scene of the cross and would sing the song of the cross. God wrote this. Now, being a, a musician in, in my former life, I've, I've experienced a lot of people who get up front and say, you know, at 2.30 in the morning, God woke me up and gave me this song. And I have to tell you, most of the time when I hear someone say that, no offense if you've said that, but most of the time when I hear that, I come away thinking, man, God's not that good of a songwriter. <laughs> you can do all the other stuff, God, but songwriting is not your, not your wheelhouse. But the reality is there is no denying here that God himself wrote these words, sent these words, and ultimately sang these words. So you would understand one of the most difficult to understand elements of the character of God. That's what's at stake here. Because I'll tell you what's going on in many of our hearts and our minds as we've gone through life asking the question, does God forsake people? We've run into this real challenge within our own lives of saying, yeah, God the Father forsook his own son. Of course he forsakes people. But I have to to ask you the same question I ask my group. I have a group called the Bible Lab at Loma Linda University Church. Uh, Every Saturday at 1030, there's a group of about 350 of us that show up just to discuss the character of God. There's four roving mics. It's a great conversation. You can connect with it at thebiblelab.com if you want to listen in on the conversations and be part of this this movement of saying the character of God is the most important thing for us to know as people of faith today. But we have a question that we always ask, because when anyone ever brings some teaching, some theology to our class, no matter how old it is or how, how new it is, we always have to ask this question. What does this say about the character of God? Because if it's anything less than God is love, then it's heresy. And we have to go back and take a look again and see what have we missed in the filters of culture and language and context? What have we missed that in any way 
This teaching says anything less than God is love. And here we have a problem, don't we? We have a problem because anyone who would say God is less love than Jesus doesn't understand God the Father. So we obviously have some more things that we have to look at here. Because if I asked you a simple question, any parents here? Maybe one or two parents here? Yeah. Oh, a lot of parents here. Let me ask you this question. I need your show of hands. Let's say your child is going through a really difficult time, possibly a very painful time, and they call you up and they say, I need you. Will you please come and help me? Is there anyone here who would say, no, I'm not going to come help you? Anybody here, your child in their time of greatest need, anyone say, no, I'm not going to come help you? Okay, so let me ask you a follow-up question. Are you a better parent than God? Because if your theology says you are a better parent than God, your theology is heretical. God himself, Jesus, the Son of God, said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Unfortunately, our theology has created this huggable, lovable Jesus, but God the Father is this God that we kind of push way back into the throne room. He's not huggable. When you think about the things you're going to do in heaven, you, you imagine running up and throwing your arms around Jesus. What do you imagine doing with God the Father? Kind of walking uh, tiptoed. There he is. I see him in my periphery. Uh, don't, look, don't look him directly in the eye. This guy, he's really touchy. He's the God of judgment. Here's Jesus, the God of love, but he's the God of judgment. If that's your view of God, it's because of what you've been taught growing up about the differences between what God the Father demands and what Jesus has done to buy you back. We have set up God the Father and God the Son over and against each other as if God the Father is saying, I've got to have blood. I've got to have blood. Otherwise, none of those sinful earthlings will ever be in my kingdom. And Jesus is there saying, don't, don't, don't whoop them, Pa. Don't kill them. I'll take their licks. You can beat me. You can whip me. You can get blood from me. And he's like, okay, well, that'll be enough. I'll be in my throne room. If that's the theology that has been built up in your mind, that's heresy. Because Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And by the end of the sermon today, it's my prayer that your number one goal will not to simply run up to Jesus and give him a hug, but it will be to have a grug, a group hug with the Father and the Son, understanding how patient God the Father has been with us to allow his name to be maligned, but at the same time to be patient and say, you'll understand me for eternity because I am love. So there's obviously something we're missing here. There's obviously a part of the story that we don't understand if we think that God the Father would forsake His Son, turn His back on His Son at this time of the cross. And I know where some of your theology comes from. It was taught to me as well. But I have to ask you this question. If Jesus and God the Father are the same. If you've seen one, you've seen the other. How did Jesus interact with sin? Because many people will say, well, pastor, you understand the reason why God had to turn his back on Jesus in that moment was because Jesus had taken on all of our sins. And he was so full of our sins that God, being of purer eyes, could not bear to look at it. Where'd you get that theology? You didn't get it from Scripture. You got it from some well-meaning evangelists and theologians of the Great Awakening, but you did not get that from Scripture. Because the question is, if they're the same, how did Jesus interact with sin? He mingled with them. He talked, looking them straight in the eye. He touched sinners. He embraced sinners. He surrounded himself with sinners. He asked sinners to be his disciples. In fact, the greatest uh, complaint about Jesus was that he ate and associated with sinners. How did Jesus treat sin? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So obviously we don't have the big picture. We need the big picture here. I love the old commercial Shows a woman in her car, and all of a sudden her, 
her car door swings open and this big burly man grabs her and begins to drag her out of the car. And, and we look on in horror thinking, oh, this poor woman, she's being assaulted. And then the camera pans out and we see that her car is on fire. And we realize there's something else going on here. And that's about the time the narrator comes on and says, you need the bigger picture. Channel 10 News has the bigger picture. We need the bigger picture here. Because if we stop right where we stopped in the song, we can still have the view that God forsook his own son. I'm thankful that the song doesn't stop here. This is not the end of the song. This is just verse 1. There's a verse 2 to this song. And when we read verse 2, we get a completely different picture. Verse 1 is all about what the people around the cross are seeing on the outside. What is happening externally at the cross? What do the people see? And verse 2, the second half of Psalm 22, talks about everything you can't see. All the things that are happening inside the heart of God. And so let's pick it up in verse 19. Where it says, but you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Jump down to verse 24. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Verse 25. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. Jesus is singing this song in his heart saying, God, we committed, we took a vow to an enemy that we don't know anything to. We took a vow that we would pay a ransom, the highest ransom ever to buy humanity back, and I will not quit now. Verse 26, the poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. In the heart of the song, God says, my whole desire is that you will live forever. Eternity. That's why Ecclesiastes 3 says he's planted eternity into the hearts of man. Verse 27 He continues singing, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. He says this thing's global. It's not just for the people in Jerusalem. It's not just for the Jews. Thankfully, it's for us Gentiles. He goes on to say in in verse 30, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. You and I are part of this song. And then, as the song is concluding in the minds of the people, these lyrics are continuing in the minds of people, Jesus pulls himself up one last time for one last bit of breath. And as the people sing in their minds the very closing stanza, verse 31, they will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. As he pulls himself up, the people sing in their minds, for he has done it. And Jesus sings that last phrase of the song, which translated into Greek, sounds like it is finished. The entire scene of the cross is a song, a song of what we see on the outside and what God feels on the inside. It's a song where God says, I don't care what it looks like, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. I don't care what you've been told. I've told you 10 times in all of the Bible, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Now that doesn't mean we can't be lost. This is the beautiful thing about God. It means that God loves you so much, he gives you the choice. You have the choice to forsake him. You can completely turn your back and forsake him, but he says, I'm sorry, I just can't do it. In fact, he clarifies in 2 Timothy 2, verse 11 through 13. He clarifies this when he says in verse 11, 2 Timothy 2, here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. But uh uh-oh, if we disown him, he will disown us. He gives us that choice. 
If we say, God, I don't want you to own me. I want you to disown me. He says, okay, I'll give you the choice. I paid the price. I want to own you. But you've chosen to be disowned. I'll let you do that. And he goes on in verse 13. He knows us. He says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Doesn't matter how faithless we are. He remains faithful. It says, for he cannot disown himself. He cannot change his stripes. It's who he is. It's just in his nature. The nature of God is to not forsake you. He just can't do it. As much as we try to make him and try to convince him that we should be disowned, he says, I just can't do it. It's not in my nature. I've got to live with you. I've got to be with you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you feel from me. It doesn't matter how dark your life is or dark the things are in your life. I can't disown you. I just can't do it. It's not in my nature. As we look back at the song of the cross, a song that Christ wrote, delivered, and ultimately sang, what does that tell you today? Do you see a God who says, I don't need you perfect. I just need you present. I, I, I don't worry about how many failures you have. I just worry about how faithful you know I am to you. As you sing the song of the cross, can you retune your mind? Can you rewrite those lyrics that you've sung for years and years? And as you sing the song, my God, my God, can you understand that he will never, ever leave you nor forsake you? Let us pray. Oh Lord God, from beginning to end, your heart has been set on us. And the faithfulness that you have demonstrated to us 
is beyond our comprehension. And we pray, Jesus, you would tune our hearts to sing your grace. You know how often we have been led astray by broken melodies, by songs of this world, by tunes that catch us and distract us, and, and secret songs that sound so close to what you're singing to us. We pray, Jesus, you pick up all our broken melodies. You sweep us up. Tune our hearts to your grace. Let us hear that heavenly music. We have a God in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit faithful to us from beginning to end. And so, in light of your great love for us, may you bind our hearts to you. We give you thanks, we give you praise, oh God. May you bless and keep your people on this day and always. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.